Audi's Q7 seven-seat luxury SUV has always made a big impact. This second generation model is lighter, cleverer and smarter, with clean diesel and plug-in hybrid technology driving impressive standards of efficiency. As a result, if you really want a car of this kind, you may well find yourself really wanting this one. Just as the dinosaurs evolved to suit a changing planet, so have large luxury SUVs. Audi's enormous Q7 more than most. Here is the vastly improved second generation model. Ever since the original version of this car was first launched in 2007, it's been a vehicle that Middle England families have always rather liked, but if truth were told, felt a bit awkward about owning. The Mark I Q7's sheer size, power and weight hardly in keeping with these eco-conscious times. Hence the need for a version of this car that really is. It's far lighter, so much more efficient and slightly smaller too, though somehow even bigger inside. And that's all possible courtesy of an all-new platform, also designed for much pricier Porsche and Bentley SUVs. The result of all this, the car first launched here in mid-2015, is a model dynamically very different from the large, lumbering original version and far more technically advanced. Tick the right option boxes and in traffic or at a cruise, it'll even virtually drive itself. Go for the diesel electric e-tron version and if all you need the car for is a school run, you might never have to visit a filling station. It's all enabled the Ingolstadt brand to rejuvenate its proposition amongst large luxury SUVs, which is just as well, given that this segment is a tougher place to survive in than ever before. Impressive new rivals from Volvo and Land Rover directly target Q7 buyers, while smaller compact luxury SUVs also threaten this car's market share from below. Even so, for many, ourselves included, there remains something tantalizingly tempting about this big Audi. The way it dominates the road as it'll dominate your driveway. You'll want to justify buying one, but will you be able to? Let's find out. Back in 2005, when the original version of this Q7 was first launched, it seemed absolutely enormous. And many of us wondered just how relevant such a huge SUV would be on tight, twisty British roads. These days, that kind of questioning no longer seems so relevant, not only because we're more used to vehicles of this type, but also because more recent designs look and feel so much lighter and more agile. The Mark I Q7 model never did, we have to say. It was lumbering from bend to bend and in every turn reminding you of its huge dimensions, a massive 2.3 tonne curb weight. So what of this, its successor? Well, on paper, the prospects are good. The Volkswagen Group has designed a completely new MLB Evo chassis for the large SUVs on sale via its various brands. And this second generation Q7 was the first vehicle to get it. Now, these are underpinnings that must be good enough to support Porsche Cayenne and Bentley Bentayga models, which potentially cost more than twice as much. So as you might expect, they feel very good indeed. The fresh platform makes the body much stiffer and along with aluminium intensive Audi space frame construction also directly contributes to the quite astonishing 240 kilograms of weight saving that in seven seat form this model has achieved as part of its second generation redesign. Now, none of this makes the Q7 sporting in the way that say a rival BMW X5 or Range Rover Sport might be but it does facilitate a quite revolutionary change in the way that you can pilot this car through a twisting series of bends. Rather than lurching reluctantly through faster turns as it did before, this Audi now seems to have a genuine appetite for them until you reach the edge of potential that's still somewhat limited by rather vague steering and significant amounts of body roll. Cornering bite is aided by a torque control management system that's built into the standard Quattro permanent all-wheel drive setup. This uses light and imperceptible braking intervention to transfer traction to the driving wheels on the inside of a curve, firing you through the bend. 
And here we're trying a key option that adds to this feeling of agility, an all-wheel steering system unique in the SUV segment. It's the kind of setup that various automotive brands have been dabbling with for years, turning the rear wheels a few degrees in either the same or the opposite direction to those at the front, depending on the situation. At parking speeds, as you turn, the rear wheels turn very slightly in the opposite direction to those at the front, which help you to slide into a bay and reduce your turning circle radius by a metre. At higher speeds, the rear wheels follow the same direction as those at the front, which improves stability, especially in sharp manoeuvres. It's a feature that has been disparaged by some writers, but one that we think is ideal for the kind of manoeuvrability and highway stability that you really need on a large SUV like this one. Also perfectly suited to this Audi is the engine that most will choose for it, a 3-litre TDI diesel V6, available in 218 PS guise but tested here in usefully pokier 272 PS form. There's also a third version, a Q7 e-tron plug-in hybrid that mates that pokier diesel unit to a 94 kilowatt electric motor and offers a potential of ludicrously low running costs, assuming that you keep the batteries charged up and make regular commuting use of the 35 mile all electric driving range. Alternatively, the e-tron model's 373 PS output can offer impressive performance with 62 miles an hour from rest achievable in six seconds flat on route to 140 miles an hour. Most Q7 buyers though are going to want a conventional diesel version like this one. We would recommend that you stretch to this faster 272 PS variant. It's not much pricier or significantly more expensive to run than its feebler 218 PS stablemate, and the performance readings get a useful boost. The 218 PS model's figures rest to 62 miles an hour in 7.4 seconds and 134 miles an hour flat out, improved here to 6.5 seconds and 145 miles an hour. That is significantly quicker than the kind of performance you get from directly comparable proper seven-seat luxury SUV rivals like Land Rover's Discovery and Volvo's XC90 D5. If you want to maximise that, then you'll need to be familiar with the settings of the standard Drive Select Driving Dynamic System, operable via this dash-mounted button here. Via Efficiency, Comfort, or if you're pressing on, Dynamic modes, this setup allows you to tweak throttle response, steering feel and the gear shift timings of the 8-speed Tiptronic auto transmission to suit the way you want to drive. If you can't decide, then there's an auto setting. While if you want to specifically alter the parameters and get, say, sharp steering feel without sharp throttle response, then there's an individual mode option. A sixth off-road mode specifically sets up this car for off-piste use. To really maximise the capability of the Drive Select setup, we'd suggest that you consider the optional adaptive air suspension system that really completes the dynamic attributes this car has to offer. With this fitted, you get a lovely, supple, magic carpet style ride in the comfort setting, even if you go for the bigger wheel option like the 21 inch rims we're trying here. And there's the advantage that the system can automatically adjust the ride position of the body to suit the driving that you'll be doing. At motorway cruising speeds, for example, where this Q7 is impressively refined, the car will be lowered by 15 millimeters to reduce drag and improve stability. You'll also get greater rough road ability too. The standard model's off-road mode supplemented by an additional lift off-road setting that at under 49 miles an hour lifts the body by 25 millimeters. Keep your speed below 18 miles an hour and a further 35 millimeters of lift can be added. Not that this Audi has been designed for heavy mud plugging use. You'd be buying a Toyota Land Cruiser or maybe a Land Rover Discovery in this segment if you were planning to regularly take to the wild. Still, for those times when you might need to pretend that you're setting out across the Serengeti, you will be reasonably well provided for. That Quattro all-wheel drive system is a proper permanent setup with a self-locking differential. It normally distributes power between front and rear axles at a 40 to 60 ratio, but if loss of traction is detected, it can instantly transfer as much as 70% of the power to the front or up to 85% of power to the rear to help you retain grip. 
Special by air suspension and your Q7's ground clearance can potentially be up to 245 millimetres. Plus, with this package, you get MMI infotainment screen displays showing pitch and roll angles, your steering wheel angle, your tilt angle, and even geographical altitude, compass, and GPS coordinates. All models get an off-road mode as part of the ESD stability control system that incorporates hill descent control to ease you down slippery slopes. Off-road capability is also enhanced by strong pulling power, and you get a slug more of that if you opt for the 272 PS 3-litre TDI diesel version rather than the base 218 PS version, the torque figure rising from 500 to 600 newton meters. You'll feel that when towing, something that will be facilitated by a clever optional towing pack that increases the braked towing capability of a Q7 with adapted air suspension to as much as 3,500 kilograms. This feature works with a rear camera and an electrically deployable tow bar in order to help you hitch up. Once you have, it allows you to manoeuvre the car using the dashboard MMI infotainment system controller and automatic electronic programming that takes all the guesswork out of trailer parking. Now, <laughs> if you're as bad at low-speed towing manoeuvres as I am and you regularly have to perform them, then this is a must-have option. The original version of this car was one of the most imposing shapes on our roads. This second generation version though is a little more subtle in its sizing, with sharp shoulder lines and chromed lower side sill blades helping to disguise dimensions that, though still considerable, see this Mark II model being slightly shorter and narrower than before. It's lighter too, having shed up to 325 kilograms of weight thanks to the latest MLB Evo chassis that the Volkswagen Group has also developed for new generations of the Porsche Cayenne and the Volkswagen Touareg, as well as the Bentley Bentayga. This Audi remains a substantial thing, mind you. Still over five meters in length, nearly two meters in width, and just as hefty as before in height. So the low-roofed multi-stories and the automated car washes that challenge the old model will continue to concentrate the mind in this one. Up front, the three-dimensional single-frame grille is broader and lower than before. It features gleaming aluminium-look crossbars and a trapezoidal frame extending right out into sculpted headlights that border the bonnet and can be optionally ordered with Audi's intelligent matrix LED technology, which is recognisable by its bright white crystal shine. Here, each headlamp unit divides its high beam into 15 individual light-emitting diodes that are activated or dimmed in 64 stages based on traffic and road condition information gathered by an integrated camera. In profile, you would swear that this model's 37mm reduction in overall length was greater than it is. Such is the effect of complex lines and surfaces that together seem to position the size of this car much closer to that of the brand's smaller Q5 SUV. As before, the wheel arches are strong and pronounced, while the mirrors are mounted high on a distinct shoulder line dominated by two sharp creases. The doors get those bright Quattro branded trim blades I mentioned and they're pulled down to cover the sills, preventing you from cleaning these with your trousers as you get out. At the rear, the square boxy corners that you get in a rival Volvo XC90 or Land Rover Discovery are replaced by a falling roof line that flows into a tailgate that wraps around these steeply raked D-pillars. The idea is to emphasise this Q7's slightly sportier intent, an attitude further embellished by the roof spoiler and lower diffuser of this S-line trimmed model. Here, at least, no effort has been made to disguise this car's substantial size, with broad, trapezoidally shaped tail lamps and sharp horizontal lines that instead emphasise its substantial width. Time to take a look inside. Well, we'll start at the rear, since we're here, and an electrically powered tailgate. The loading lip is 48 millimetres lower than it was in the previous generation model, and if you've specified adapted air suspension, the loading height can be further lowered by another 55 millimetres via these buttons in the luggage compartment. That means you'll easily enough be able to get your stuff in, but the items in question can't be too big if all seven seats are in place, just 295 litres of capacity being available with the interior in this configuration. 
just as well then that the room that you do get is pretty usable with bag hooks and lashing points and a partition net all provided. It's a pity that there's nowhere to put the load cover when that's not in use. Most of the time though, of course, you'll probably be running the car with these third row chairs folded down. The retracting process operated electrically by these buttons, which make the process so much easier than the back-breakingly fumbly manual machinations that you have to go through in a rival Land Rover Discovery to achieve the same end result. Once that's completed, there's a lot of room to play with. 770 litres of it to be exact in standard models or 650 litres in the five-seat only plug-in hybrid e-tron variant. Either way, you can improve on those figures that I've just quoted by sliding the second row seats forward if you have uncomplaining middle row passengers on board. Otherwise, getting more room means folding the middle row. The backrest falls in a 35-30-35 split, so if you've a long item to push through, say a set of skis, you may merely need to flatten the centre section. Lower everything and as much as 1,955 litres of fresh air can be created in a standard variant or 1,835 litres in an e-tron model. True, that is nothing like as much as you get in a boxy Land Rover Discovery, but it's a figure directly comparable to a rival Volvo XC90 and significantly better than the one achieved by an equivalent BMW X5. Now let's take a seat at the wheel where, as expected, there's one of the best interiors that Audi can offer, which makes this one amongst the very nicest it's possible to find. You're ensconced in a world of measured elegance with beautiful ambient lighting, a luxurious blend of craftsmanship fused with technology and a wraparound dash fashioned in a wide arc that spans the cabin, encircling the slim, sleek instrument panel. Its front, characterised in the passenger area by this distinctive air vent strip, isn't joined to the centre console, a design approach offering a greater feeling of space. The console itself is angled like a control stand, its right half being what Audi calls the technical area, dominated by a gorgeous aeronautical gear lever that makes you feel like you're bringing a 747 into land. Just ahead of it is the chrome switch gear for the further improved MMI infotainment system, a rotary controller, and beyond that, a large touchpad with a scratch-resistant glass surface upon which commands can be traced with your fingertips. The main display interface for the system is an 8.3-inch high-resolution screen that glides out of the top of the fascia every time the ignition is started, beautifully integrated into an overall dashboard design that no other premium brand can match. Much of the infotainment functionality can also be duplicated into the instrument binnacle that you view through the spokes of the leather-trimmed multifunction steering wheel, either onto a colour display that comes as standard between two conventional dials, or better still, onto the optional virtual cockpit instrument layer that we're trying here. This 12.3-inch virtual display is fully digital and customizable with crisp 3D graphics and highly detailed effects that can be viewed in two ways. The classic display shows you a prominent speedometer, rev counter and gear indicator. Alternatively, the progressive display reduces the size of these items and brings functions like the navigation map or your media settings to the fore. Now we're going to see many more instrument binnacle layouts of this kind in future years and this one really sets the standard that they must all try to reach when it comes to clarity and ease of use. Audi gets the basics right too, or most of them anyway. Over the shoulder vision remains awkward enough to make you glad of these standard parking sensors but otherwise there's little to grouse about. The leather seats may be thinner and lighter than they were before, but they're still supremely comfortable, power adjustable and heated with optional cooling and massage functions. Around them you get class-leading head and shoulder room in this Mark II model, and if budget permits, you can add the final touches by specifying almost any kind of cabin trim it's possible to imagine. Maybe brushed aluminium or high-gloss black for a modern feel, or oak, ash, myrtle or walnut veneer finishes if you want to replicate the kind of ambience you get in Bentley's Bentayga, an SUV that draws on much of this Q7's engineering. Okay. 
Your middle row passengers will enjoy this kind of quality too, of course, and are well catered for in other ways. They have their own controls for this S-Line model's four-zone climate control system and backrests that recline through 16 increments for greater comfort on longer journeys, with individual seats that have 110 millimetres of longitudinal travel so that they can be pushed forwards or backwards to maximise either legroom or the space behind. Now, those familiar with the first generation Q7 who might be worried that this one's 15 millimetre reduction in overall width will make it feel more restricted back here need not fret. Shoulder width has somehow actually been increased by 10 millimetres in this Mark II model. Plus there's a 26 millimetre increase in legroom too. You also get the practicality of door pockets that can accommodate one and a half litre bottles and buyers have the option of this huge panoramic glass roof that gives this part of the cabin a light airy feel. Something we think you'd really want in a seven seat car. Ah yes, the proper seven seat functionality we mentioned earlier. We well, don't have to have it. A five seat only configuration is a no cost option and is conditional if you go for the plug-in hybrid e-tron model. For most owners of the Q7 though, the seven seat layout will be part of the appeal of this car. And time to put it to the test. Now, Audi doesn't pretend this area to be suitable for adults on long distances with this sloping rear roof line it could never be. Still, the company's designers have put a lot of effort into making these rearmost chairs more accessible than they were in the previous version of this model. The seats now glide electrically out of the floor, while access to them is eased by outer second row seats that fold into a compact package and can be set upright freeing up room for you to pass. And get yourself into reasonably comfortable chairs that Audi says are suitable for children of up to 36 kilograms or 5.7 stone in weight. To be honest, a pew here as an adult wouldn't be too objectionable on a short journey, provided those in the middle row were prepared to push their seats right forward. True, it is nothing like as spacious here as it would be in a rival Volvo XC90 or Land Rover Discovery, but the room provided is much better than it would be with the optional fold-out chairs that you can specify in a BMW X5 or a Range Rover Sport. From launch, this Q7 was pitched as a £50,000 car, that being the sum required for ownership of the core model that we're trying here, the 3-litre TDI diesel with 272 PS. Potential buyers can make a saving of around £3,000 by opting for the slightly more efficient 218 PS version of the car, or they can push their budget up towards £60,000 and opt for the clever diesel electric e-tron plug-in hybrid variant, which offers 373 PS and the potential of a 35 mile pure electric driving range. Whatever your choice of model, there's a premium of around £3,500 if you want to upgrade from base SE to sportier S-Line trim. You can also ask your dealer about a potent SQ7 derivative that uses a V8 diesel engine featuring clever electric turbocharging technology. All Q7s come with quattro four-wheel drive and eight-speed Titron automatic transmission. All bar the e-tron variant get seven seats as standard too. Though across the range, deletion of that third row is a no-cost option. On to the value proposition, which we'll consider basing our thinking around this car in standard six-cylinder diesel form, since that is what the vast majority of likely buyers will be looking at. The Q7 sits a notch above large, plush, but clunkier seven-seat SUVs like Kia Sorento, Hyundai Santa Fe and Toyota's Land Cruiser. And many potential customers will be happy to pay this out as premium over those kind of cars, which is typically around about £15,000 for this model's extra class, its quality, extra efficiency, technology and better on-road driving dynamics. We're also going to assume here that one of the reasons you're looking at Q7 ownership is because you like the idea of its seven-seat carrying capacity. 
If so, that rules out the possibility of finding the same sort of money as Audi is asking here and getting yourself, say, a Porsche Cayenne, a Mercedes GLE class or a BMW X6. Or for a little less, getting yourself a Volkswagen Touareg, a Lexus RX 450h or a Jeep Grand Cherokee. All of these cars, you see, lack a third row seating option. So, enough of luxury SUVs that you won't want as an alternative to this car. What is more directly comparable? Well, if you were looking at this Q7 3 litre TDI 272 PS model, the same sort of spend would buy you a BMW X5 xDrive 30D, while around £12,000 more would get you a Range Rover Sport SDV6. In both cases, you get the extra cost option of fold-out third row seating, but it would be a more cramped setup than the one Audi offers here. And in using it, you'll appreciate the difference between occasional boot-mounted chairs and what you get in this case, purpose-designed third row seating. Now, this Q7 certainly isn't the most spacious luxury SUV if you want room for seven, but it does a much better job of offering three seating rows than an X5 or a Range Rover Sport would do. There aren't many comparable rivals in this segment that can claim to be able to manage the same thing. Mercedes' big GLS class model is a possible option, but it's 20% pricier and much less wieldy than this Audi. Land Rover's Discovery and Volvo's XC90, though, are a much closer match for this Q7, competing directly with it in terms of price, size, power and positioning. Both are boxier than the Saudi and so would be more appropriate choices if you'll regularly be taking adults in the third row. For most buyers, though, these extra chairs will be intended for children, putting this Audi back on a level playing field with the Disco and the Volvo. So, which to choose? Well, the Discovery is a solid choice, but its off-road prowess does make it a slightly less engaging tarmac tool, which is why we'd be looking at Volvo's XC90 as the most direct match for this Q7. In volume D5 diesel, guys, the XC90 has been pitched precisely against the base 218 PS 3-litre TDI version of this Audi in terms of cost, performance and efficiency. It's not as sleekly styled though, and crucially, perhaps not quite as rewarding to drive. In the Volvo, you can never really forget that you're piloting a large SUV. In this Audi, sometimes you do. And for us, that is a crucial difference. If having considered all of that, you conclude that it is a Q7 that you really want, then you're gonna need to know just how generous Audi has been with the standard spec. Well, let's see. All models come with 19-inch alloy wheels, Xenon Plus headlights with washers and LEDs for the daytime running lights and the rear lamps. You get a full body colour paint finish across the range these days, along with aluminium roof rails, auto headlamps and wipers, front and rear parking sensors and a power-operated tailgate. Inside, there's leather upholstery, power adjustable heated front seats and power operation for raising or lowering the third row chairs too. Also included are dual zone climate control, a leather multifunction steering wheel with gear shift paddles, an interior lighting package, keyless starting, cruise control and an auto dimming rear view mirror. And the Audi Drive Select adaptive dynamic system so that you can tweak steering, throttle response and the change times of the eight speed auto gearbox to suit the way that you want to drive. Perhaps the most important piece of standard interior equipment though is the infotainment system. Audi calls it MMI Navigation Plus with MMI Touch. Uh, this displays using an 8.3 inch screen that electrically rises from the dashboard with functionality accessible either via a touch sensitive panel in front of the gear stick through an MMI rotary dial or by using voice control. Through this setup, you get a 180 watt 10 speaker stereo system with a DAB radio and the Audi Music interface, which offers a universal connection for USB and MP3 devices, plus the Apple iPod. There's also a full navigation system with 3D map display, which is one of the things you can choose to view more directly on your line of sight on a colour driver information screen that with the conventional instrument binnacle will sit between the two main dials. 
Also part of the MMI package is a speed limit display, a 10 gigabyte flash memory for music, a DVD drive, a couple of SD card readers and USB sockets and an aux in port. As expected, you get Bluetooth phone connectivity too, and the option of going further by adding a smartphone interface, either Apple CarPlay or Google Android Auto, depending on the system that you use. This opens up your full handset functionality for in-car use, primarily for online music streaming and apps like Pandora, Spotify and WhatsApp, as well as things like reminders or messaging functions. The smartphone interface is an extra cost addition to the whole MMI Navigation Plus with MMI Touch system. And so is the thing that really completes the MMI setup's functionality, namely the Audi Connect connectivity system. This is a data transmission module that establishes high-speed 4G Internet 3 access and creates in your car a Wi-Fi hotspot. And it comes free for the first three months of ownership before you have to stump up the £350 that Audi charges for a three-year subscription. With Connect fitted to your Q7, you'll be able to navigate with images from Google Earth, access a Google points of interest search function with voice control and use a web radio setup with stations from all around the world. Through the Connect system, you can also access special in-car versions of your Facebook and Twitter pages. And it's also possible to read, write and send text messages and emails. The included online media streaming package gives access to millions of music tracks. Plus, there's also a clever Audi online traffic information system that uses live traffic information to reroute you around jams. Plus, the setup can also deliver parking information and display details on parking lots and parking garages almost anywhere you're likely to go. Truly, this is motoring in the 21st century. Mind you, motoring in the 21st century always has scope for more sophistication, and this Audi certainly does. The first Q7 upgrade that most owners are going to want to consider is to progress from the base SE trim level to sportier looking S line spec, a move which will get them a car like the one we're trying here. There's no firmed up suspension for this version, for which some will be thankful but you do get a far more dynamic look, courtesy of larger 20-inch wheels, privacy glass, and an S-line body styling package that gives you smarter bumpers, a roof spoiler, and changes to the front spoiler lip and to the rear diffuser. The headlights become all-weather LED items that can dip themselves at night, and there are neat dynamic rear indicators that put on a sweeping light show every time you flick them on. Inside, you get embossed sport seats that are leather and Alcantara trimmed, plus a sport steering wheel and wider reaching four zone climate control. Beyond that, it's a question of making your choice from the options list. And for us, the key extra cost features are those that directly improve the driving experience. Probably the most important of the lot is the adaptive air suspension that completes the functionality of the Drive Select Active Dynamic System that I mentioned earlier by allowing you to match the ride of your Q7 to suit the mood you're in and the road that you're on. The comfort setting cushions you on tarmac, while a lift off-road setting provides for great off-piste prowess. Air suspension is now common in this segment, but an option on this Audi that's completely new to this kind of car is all-wheel steering. We've been trying it here and really like it. At high speeds, the rear wheels turn slightly in the same direction as the front for extra stability. At low speeds, they turn in the opposite direction to those at the front for the kind of extra urban manoeuvrability that you really appreciate in a vehicle as big as this one. What else? Well, we'd certainly suggest that you look at the brand's achingly sophisticated Matrix LED headlamps with their distinctive crystal-like shine. Now, these don't need to fully dip themselves at night because individual LEDs in the light unit adapt themselves to the needs of other road users while moving with the corners and using information from the navigation system to adjust to the kind of route that you're on. Also brilliant is the Audi Virtual Cockpit, a 12.3-inch high-resolution screen 
in the instrument binnacle that completely replaces the usual set of conventional dials, instead offering a virtual display that you can customise with crisp 3D graphics and highly detailed effects based on what you actually want to see. Not that you're going to be looking at it much if you opt for the head-up display, which projects key driving information onto the bottom of the windscreen. Other features that will also make driving such a large car easier include a rear-view camera and a night vision setup that now recognises animals. We'd also want to look at the parking assist pack option, which steers you into spaces and gives you a surround-view camera system. That latter feature is great, not only for getting into a tight bay, but also for alerting you to roots and stumps when you're inching along off-road. If you regularly tow, then you're also going to want to look at the trailer pack with its incorporated electrically deployable tow bar. Here you get technology that allows you to more accurately manoeuvre backwards to hitch up using the MMI infotainment system's rotary controller and then enables you to manoeuvre vehicle and trailer at low speeds without using the steering wheel. Get it with air suspension and the permitted trailer load rises to as much as 3,500 kilograms. And beyond that, well, other items you might want to consider include a huge panoramic glass sunroof, power door closure, heated power folding mirrors, heat and sound insulating glass, a heated windscreen and an advanced key that will unlock the doors with the key still in your pocket. We'd also want the Audi phone box option, which enables you to charge your smartphone and boost its signal via the vehicle antenna. Seats are important too, and there is a wide choice of them, with extra cost ventilation and massage systems, and the option of a super supportive comfort seat with pneumatic side bolster adjustment. You might want to treat yourself to a stereo upgrade too. Now this car has been fitted with a wonderful 19 speaker, 558 watt, 15 channel Bose 3D surround sound setup. If my company was paying though, I might even want to tick the box for the 23 speaker, 1920 watt Bang & Olufsen advanced sound system. For entertainment perfection, match this to a digital TV tuner and possibly also to the Audi Entertainment Mobile package that gives you two detachable 10.1 inch screens for rear seat passengers. Now, while we're talking luxury non-essentials, things like the huge but very tempting 21-inch wheels that we've got fitted here, I'll also mention that there's a choice of three or four-spoke multifunction steering wheels that can be electrically adjusted and optionally heated. And there's upgraded Valcona or Nappa leather too. The latter offered as part of an extended leather package that also covers much of an instrument panel that can be divided into upper and lower colour zones. Go for that, and as a finishing touch, you probably want to select from the sumptuous interior inlays that Audi offers, with finishes in aluminium and high gloss black, or various types of wood, oak, walnut, myrtle, or ash. Here we've got upper inlays in brushed aluminium and lower inlays in oak grey, and thanks to another extra cost feature, the ambient lighting pack, these create a beautiful interior ambience at night. It's lovely. The practical stuff's important too, of course, and there are a few minor annoyances here. Why can't Audi fit the usefully larger 85-litre fuel tank as standard? And why can't you have a spare wheel with this car unless you delete the third-row seating? If Volvo can build in a third-row mechanism than their rival XC90 model that leaves space for a spare, then Audi ought to be able to do the same thing. Other useful features include some helpful luggage area items, a reversible mat, a partitioning net and a load area fixing kit, plus an electric luggage compartment cover. Otherwise, the practical options are much as expected, so you'll be able to get all the usual optional racks for things like skis, snowboards and roof boxes. Uh, bear in mind that many of the items I've mentioned can be ordered as part of packs that group together various items. So, Look carefully and consult with your Audi centre before buying extra features individually. It's worth knowing that many of these packs also have the advantage of including in key additional safety items, some of them very advanced indeed. Take as an example of that the parking pack advanced option. 
Now this takes the self-parking and surround view camera features of the parking assist pack that I mentioned earlier and additionally packages in four significant extra safety elements. A rear traffic crossing feature that alerts you to oncoming cars if you're reversing out of a space and an exit warning system that monitors the rear and side of your Q7 as you get out of it, alerting you if vehicles or cyclists are approaching from behind. On the move, Audi Side Assist works as a blind spot monitor, warning you if you're dangerously about to pull out to overtake in the path of another vehicle. Plus, there's an Audi PreSense Basic and PreSense Rear package that in the event of an inevitable front or rear impact, optimally prepares the car to best survive it. Now, since I've started on the subject of safety, let's continue on that theme. Even the most basically specified Q7 will come very well provided for indeed in that respect, with a standard fit highlight of all models being a collision avoidance system that Audi calls PreSense City. Now, this is one of those setups that constantly scans the road ahead in search of potential accident hazards. If it detects one, then you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or you aren't able to, then the system will automatically brake the car and should be able to avoid a collision at speeds of under 90 miles an hour. If you're going faster than that, the pre-sense city system will reduce your speed to reduce your impact while pre-tensioning seatbelts and closing windows to prepare for the crash. As for more common standard safety features, well, all versions of this car also get Isofix child seat fastenings, anti-whiplash head restraints and a tyre pressure loss indicator, plus twin front, side and curtain airbags with rear side bags, an extra cost option. In addition, as expected in this segment, there's a complete roster of electronic acronyms, including the usual electronic assistance for braking, for traction and for stability control. There's also a rest recommendation feature that monitors your driving for drowsiness, alerting you if necessary to stop for restorative coffee. On uphill junctions, you'll be glad of a hill hold assist feature that stops you from drifting backwards. And off-road, there's the assistance of hill descent control to ease you down the steepest slippery slopes. It's always possible to go further, though, and should you want extra peace of mind, your Audi centre salesperson will doubtless point you towards the choicest elements of the safety technology developed for this car, all of which are included in what the brand calls its tour pack. Now, this gives you six key extra electronic safety items that really could make the difference between a near miss and a very bad day. Let me run through them for you. We'll start with the tour pack features that are useful on the highway. Firstly, there's Audi Active Lane Assist to gently steer you back into your lane if you inadvertently drift out of it. Next, there's Adaptive Cruise Control with Stop and Go and Distance Display Warning. That system's there to automatically keep your Q7 a set distance behind the car in front on the highway, warning you if you're too close to another vehicle and able to automatically stop you and then start you off again if you come across a tailback. An equally clever predictive efficiency assist system works with this setup, regulating your Audi's speed for maximum efficiency and also offering driving tips that could create fuel savings of up to 10%. Uh, you think that's neat? Then check out the Dynamic Pack's fourth feature, Traffic Jam Assist, a setup that can brake, accelerate and steer your car for you automatically at speeds of up to 37 miles an hour. Yes, really. Then there's traffic sign recognition that can picture road signs and display them on the dash. And finally, there's Audi PreSense Front with collision avoidance assist and turn assist. Now, this adds to the capability of that standard PreSense City system I was talking about earlier, with front sensors in the lower bumper that can even automatically steer you around a collision hazard if it's too late to brake and completely avoid it. Now, those same sensors will automatically break your Q7 if you're turning at a junction and try and pull out in front of an oncoming vehicle without looking. I mean, this saves you from yourself. It's all very reassuring. This car can be up to 325 kilograms lighter than its predecessor. <laughs> Just think about that for a moment. We're talking about the weight of a grand piano or a reduction equivalent to the saving that you'd make if you asked four of the fully sized adult passengers to get out and walk. 
The figure I've quoted applies to the five seat version of this car, but even with seven seats fitted, a huge 240 kilogram weight saving is still delivered. It's all been made possible due to the introduction of the Volkswagen Group's sophisticated new generation MLB Evo chassis and the use of Audi space frame construction that allows 41% of the body structure to be fashioned from aluminium. Now, you'll find this light, stiff metal all over the place around this car, on the front wings, on the tailgate, even the brake pedal. Its use has been a key factor in a program of weight reduction so astonishingly rigorous that it enables the two-ton curb weight of this six-cylinder Audi to match that of a rival four-cylinder Volvo XC90. As a result, much to the Swedish brand's annoyance, the fuel returns of this Q7 now actually slightly shade those of the rival XC90 D5 model that would otherwise be the efficiency leader when it comes to this kind of car. This Q7 in 3 litre TDI 218 PS guys manages 52.3 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 144 grams per kilometre of CO2. In other words, about the same running cost that you get from a little 1.6 litre automatic petrol Ford Focus. Yet, this Audi still gives you four-wheel drive and the kind of seven-seat capability that means that when we're going out as a family and my kids want to take their friends, we can take one car instead of two. So much for big luxury SUVs polluting the planet. If you wanted another point of comparative perspective, then I'll tell you that a two-wheel drive, five-seat BMW X5 S-Drive 25D is thirstier and dirtier than that. There's not much of a penalty for upgrading yourself into the Pokia 272 PS 3 litre TDI diesel Q7 model I'm trying here either. A variant that's about 20% cleaner and more frugal than its direct first generation predecessor. This car manages 47.9 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 153 grams per kilometre of CO2, which still pretty much matches the showing of that Volvo XC90 D5 model I mentioned, despite the fact that this Audi gives you 47 PS more and so is significantly faster. As a result, this Q7's benefiting kind tax rating has fallen from the 37% figure your payments would have been based on in an equivalent first generation model to just 28% this time around, which puts the car in VED band G. Now you won't better that elsewhere in this segment and this model's other most direct rival, Land Rover's Discovery, will cost you significantly more to run. So how has Audi done it? Through patient technological development is the answer. I've already talked about weight reduction, but that just builds upon all the other efficiency initiatives that the brand has developed and perfected over the years, with new ideas continually added to the company's model lineup. Let me give you just one example here, the optional predictive efficiency assist system that could potentially improve your fuel economy by as much as 10%. Now it works with the navigation package and analyzes any given route once set to decide how the journey could be undertaken more efficiently, taking into account things like uh, speed limits, traffic signs, bends and the roundabouts that you'll be encountering along the way. The setup then offers you driving tips that will help you achieve that. Perhaps, for example, a uh, junction is out of sight around the next bend and you could take your foot off the accelerator a little earlier got onto the motorway and with the optional adaptive cruise control system activated, predictive efficiency assist will automatically make all the frugal driving adjustments for you. If it knows that you're going to be travelling through a few junctions, it'll even disengage the engine at cruising speeds for greater efficiency and then re-engage it immediately and almost seamlessly when you either accelerate or brake. Rivals will doubtless copy this. Ours Audi itself has copied but then perfected many of the other efficiency features that are now commonplace on cars in this segment. Take the engine stop start system which cuts power when you don't need it, when you're stuck in traffic jams or waiting at traffic lights. Or the efficiency setting on the drive select vehicle dynamic system which tweaks the air conditioning, the gear shift timings and the throttle response for maximum frugality. 
Then there's brake energy recuperation, which recycles energy you'd otherwise lose when braking or cruising. A class leadingly slippery 0.32 CD drag factor. A climate control system that can be used in highly economic eco mode. A gear shift indicator. And an efficiency program that you'll find on the onboard computer that gives you fuel saving tips and even tells you which elements in the car are using most power. There's also a stage beyond all of this though for potential Q7 owners to consider. What if you could take this Q7 model's very efficient turbocharged 272 PS 3 litre diesel V6 and then mate it to plug-in hybrid technology that included a 94 kilowatt electric motor driving the rear wheels? Well, you'd have yourself one of the world's most powerful and cleanest SUVs. More specifically, you'd have this Q7 in diesel electric e-tron, guys. Although in this form, you can only have the car with five seats. As with any plug-in hybrid, this model offers the option of charging from mains power. Our owners will be able to buy a wall box that will charge their car on 16 amp power in two and a half hours. If you're out and about and can find a 10 amp public charging point or connect up to a normal domestic supply, the charging time will inevitably be a bit longer, of course. However you charge your Q7 e-tron once it's powered up, you can, providing you drive sensibly, expect up to 35 miles of electric-only progress. Now that's more than the total distance most people drive in a day and incidentally is nine miles more than you get from a rival Volvo XC90 T8. Theoretically then you could use a Q7 e-tron throughout each week without ever visiting a fuel station unless you needed to undertake a longer trip. In reality of course most owners will more commonly be using the hybrid capability of this car and selecting a drive mode that will allow the engine to continually alternate between diesel and electric power. A setting that forms the basis for a faintly incredible sounding set of running cost figures. 166.2 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 46 grams per kilometre of CO2. While we can't imagine any Q7 e-tron owner ever actually achieving those sorts of returns, the important thing is that the government believes them. So business users will be able to write down as much as 100% of the cost of this car against their tax liability. And a 40% taxpayer could be driving this car while incurring a benefit in kind tax bill of no more than around £100 a month. If you're a business buyer browsing in this segment, those are figures that will reward a bit of thought if you're just about to blindly sign on the dotted line for a conventional diesel model. What else? Well, insurance groupings will be very comparable to those of other premium brands in this segment, as are maintenance costs, which can be kept down if you go for one of the prepaid servicing plans that you'll be offered at initial purchase. In fact, this car can even book its own service appointments via an Audi Connect safety and service system. As well as providing emergency calling and online roadside assistance, this feature can, at the appropriate time, send a service request direct to your local dealer. Bear in mind that at garage visits you'll need to get a top up for the AdBlue additive that works with the TDI engine's diesel particulate filter and selective catalytic reduction system to remove particles and nitrogen oxides from the exhaust emissions. I'll finish by covering residual values, which, as usual with this Ingolstadt brand, are predicted to be impressive, reflective of the unsurpassed build quality on offer here. In development of this car, Audi even left a Q7 parked in the Namibian desert for six months just to see what would happen to it in the blistering sun. It's the kind of attention to detail that creates such an appetite for Q7s in the used market. Independent experts cap monitor reckoning that after the usual three-year, 60,000 mile period, a diesel version like this one will cling on to around 45% of its original asking price. Not bad for a big luxury SUV and better than you get from the BMW and Mercedes alternatives in this class. CAP also reckoned that low depreciation will combine with the fuel and CO2 savings here to create an impressive overall running cost figure, predicted to be 58.62 pence per mile for this Pokia diesel version. It is rare to find a second generation model design representing such a seismic step forward from its predecessor. That is the case here though. In comparison to this Mark II model, the original Q7 was little more than a very luxurious blunt instrument in its approach to large SUV motoring. 
you could respect it for what it did, but it was very hard to admire it for what it was. Something radical was needed and something radical happened. As a result, we've been given this very different car. Powerful, lightweight and agile, so at last relevant, dynamic and likeable. It's a big Audi SUV that, in an eco-conscious world, you could now own proudly rather than slightly awkwardly. A statement of technology and innovation with electronic intuition, anticipating needs you didn't know you had as well as simply a very plush and practical way to transport your household, well, just about anywhere. It looks the part, the badge works for the boardroom, it's as capable off-road as most will ever need, and the seven-seat format is fine for families. True, there are rival large SUVs that are better to drive in this segment, but none of them are as practical. And yes, there are certainly others that are significantly cheaper, but none of them are as advanced. In summary, we're left with a car that's slimmed down and shaped up. Audi are certainly aware that a model of this kind can never be completely ecocentric, but as they've proved in this case, there's certainly plenty that can be done to reduce its environmental impact. In short, what we have here is simply this, a lesson in Vorsprung Dirk Technik.